What is God saying to us this morning as a church? I'm going to be talking about to build disciples, the gospel, and the church. This is really much on multiplication. I believe that we have a great church and we can see things multiply going into the future. Let's read our main scripture for this month, which is out of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 5. And it says, Now, brethren or brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas on, and then to the twelve. Amen. This is the gospel you receive from us in this church as well, that Christ died for our sins on the cross, that He went to the grave, that He was raised on the third day, and that He is still alive today, that He's seated at the right hand of the Father, that we have a sympathetic high priest, we can pray in the name of Jesus, and we know that He hears our prayers. The gospel cannot only be a story, the gospel must be lived. Amen. And I think that sometimes where the church sometimes does not get out to the world is because we see the gospel as a religion. But the gospel is actually based on a relationship. The core of the gospel is a relationship. If there's no relationship with God through His Son, Jesus, there will be no conviction for us to go out and do the work of the ministry. Amen. And God has not only called the pastoral staff to the work of the ministry. How many of you know this? Come on, each one of you need to know that this morning. The Bible says that God has called us to the ministry of reconciliation. What does this mean? For people to be reconciled back to God. How many of you know that the movement called the Assemblies of God movement, which, is, which traditionally was more of our African folk in the Assemblies of God, was called the movement and they were called back to God. They had crusades in big tents. Nicholas Bengu was their leader. They saw healings, deliverances, and salvations in multitudes, but they were calling people back to God as God gave a vision to Nicholas Bengu to say, call my people back, amen, that Africa can only be saved if the Holy Spirit falls on the people. That was the theme song of that, that conferences or those crusades in those days. How many of you know that song? Any of you know? Here we go. Pastor, you can continue. Uh-huh. Amen. Come on. <laughs> Let's keep Pastor Keith. For going. And that same song it says, the Holy Spirit must come down and Africa shall be saved. How many of you know the Spirit must come down in the church so that people can get saved? And that just excites me again to remind me of my Pentecostal roots. I grew up in the Assemblies of God Church. I've always believed in this. Let me give you a short example of a story before I get into our main points for today. I've only got three points today and I'm going to be quick. Amen. How many pastors have told you that before? <laughs> I'm going to be quick. I'm bound by this. Okay, so when I was in Stuttram, I told you this before, and I, I really, there's a few occasions in my life where I said, Lord, if this is true, if your spirit is real, I want to see it. I want to experience it. Lord, I want to experience it in my time. I don't want to say one day when I'm old, I hope the Holy Spirit will still come down. I don't want to be one of those people that said, you know, the good old days. I don't want to be one of those people that said, I, I read about it in the Bible, but I never experienced it in my life, in my lifespan. I mean, I want to be one of those people. So I went to start from young preacher, Pastor George and Pastor Gaylor kicked me out of the nest. Myself and Liesl, we went flying like little, like eaglets, you know, the eaglets, the, the little dauncies, the little soft parts of the nest gets taken out first. And then the, the eagle mother starts moving that little eaglet to the, to the end of the, of the, of the cliff. And the eaglet doesn't want to jump, but the eaglet gets forced out of the nest. That's not what happened. Yeah. <laughs> but it happens like that. And then the little eaglet has to jump and spread its wings. And then the mother, if it doesn't make it, catches it. Brings it back up to the nest again. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what God does with us? And I want to say to you this morning that God is maybe removing some of the soft stuff around you. Prophetically, I want to say that, that God is going to make you so uncomfortable in these days that you have to either stand for the kingdom or not for the kingdom. You can't stand in the middle anymore. You can't stand with your one leg in the kingdom and your one leg in the world. You see, God is looking for people that will choose a side and which side are you on. And we had to choose. And so God sent us to Stuttram. I'm there in one of our first home meetings, what we call a connect group here. And a lot of the older guys in the church are there together. And I say, I read the story of this lady in Zululand, in KwaZulu Natal. And she was a missionary. She, was from, she couldn't speak Zulu, but she said, I want to speak Zulu. 
And the people there had enough faith to take the Zulu Bible and put it on her head and began to pray for her. And she started speaking fluent Zulu and could understand Zulu for the whole period of time that she was doing mission work in KwaZulu-Natal. Isn't it powerful? That God can still do that today. Miracles are about to happen in the church like never before. And so I said, I'm one of those people, Lord, I also want that. Are you one of those people? Don't leave me out. You know, when all the kids, when you give sweets to your one kid, you better give sweets to your other kid. Otherwise, you've got a battle on your hands that you don't want. Okay? If you give to the one, you have to give to the So I say, Lord, if, if that woman can receive it, what's, what's wrong with me? I also want to receive it. So I said to the guys, pray for me. So they, they prayed for me. Didn't have a Kosa Bible, but they had hands. Put it on my head, and I started speaking Kosa fluently. I couldn't speak. Started speaking phrases. I mean, I wish I could speak phrases now. The one guy next to me started crying, a farmer. He said, I understand perfectly what you're saying. You're saying you're praising the Lord. You're praying for people. You're talking about God's goodness. You're talking about God's mercy. And this guy's tears are coming down his eyes. And he's saying, the Lord is good. Eh? God is real. He's really doing stuff here in our midst. And that was the beginning of ministry in Statram. Eh? Started off like that supernaturally. And we saw a lot of things happen supernaturally there because of the one person called the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit did come down on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And he fell upon them. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, if the Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be my witnesses. That's a witness to the Kosa people, to the Zulu people, to the Sutu people, to the Sri Lankan people, to the Indian people, to the Chinese people, to whoever people there are. You can speak their language if the Spirit comes upon you. Come on, some of you are not excited about that. I'm happy with my language, thank you. So, but today we're going to talk about building disciples. We're going to talk about multiplication. How many of you know multiplication is needed in the church? This was what Jesus intended when he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them that everything that I've commanded you. That's the great commission. You know, Jesus left not only the disciples with the great commission, but he left his church for eternity with the great commission until he returns to fetch us. He left his, not only his disciples on those days, this is a commission to each one of you this morning to make disciples. Making disciples is not a suggestion. It is a commission unto the church for every person. What is a disciple? A disciple has been shown to be someone who follows the teachings, life, and aim of another until the person becomes like the master. How many of you want to become like Jesus? How many of you wear those things? What would Jesus do? You see, if you want to become like Jesus, you have to follow Jesus. What you follow is what you become like. Amen. If you, if you follow other social media groups, and you're going to become like them. You're going to start talking like them, thinking like them. And the people you surround yourself with influences your life more than you think. You see, when you're in a conversation all the time on negativity, you become a negative person. If you're all the time talking about how things are not going to change, you will never see change in your lifetime. You see, you need to begin to hang out with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and you'll begin influenced by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and you'll begin to speak life into other people's lives. And not only other people, but you'll speak that life into your family. You see, word in, word out. Rubbish in, rubbish out. Amen. You see, the things that you put into this filter, this mind of yours, will drop into your heart eventually and will become part of what you do. Not only of what you think, but what you act. You see, you and I need to be permeated with the Word of God and the Spirit of the Lord so that we can act as Jesus acted. And that's what a disciple is. His whole goal, a disciple's whole goal, is to become like his teacher, to become like his master. And we often say, I want to be like Jesus. But you cannot have shortcuts becoming like Jesus. You have to first die to Julius before you become Jesus. Amen to people. I realized this long time ago. People don't want to meet Julius. They want to meet Jesus. You see, the more we build in the flesh, the less people receive of the Spirit. These are things you need to write down. Come on, these are hot off the press. Holy Spirit is giving them to you this morning. The more you build into your flesh, the more people will receive flesh. The more you build into the Spirit, the more people will see Jesus, and the Spirit of God will begin to speak through you and in you. Not only will people change around you, but you will begin to change. A disciple lays down his life to follow all that the Master teaches. Discipleship in the Christian sense is the process of making someone become like Christ. The disciple of Christ is to become like Christ in everything. Everything. The way you love, the way you give, the way you serve, the way you work. Everything about you speaks about Jesus. That's a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let me read you a scripture of the multiplication that happened in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 6 verse 7. Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. You see in the book of Acts, multiplication was always in God's plan. It says there, then the word of God spread and here's the key. The word is what activates multiplication in the church. We have the word as the seed, and a seed has potential to become greater than the size that it is right now. If you look at an apple seed, it can produce a whole apple tree. Isn't that powerful? And the gospel and the word of God is like a seed that was planted. It becomes the biggest tree. The Bible compares it to the biggest tree, that mustard seed that was planted, so that many birds will find nesting in it. And so I want to say to you this morning, do not neglect the Word of God. When we preach the Word, we believe the Word, we live the Word, we act the Word, this will happen. And the number of disciples will multiply. What does this mean in our terms? Your neighbor will get saved. What does this mean? Your mother will get saved. Your mother-in-law will get saved, Pastor George. <laughs> Back to the mother-in-laws. My mother-in-law saved a long time ago. She's a blessing to our house. Amen. So your, your friends will get saved. And not only that, the stranger on the street will get saved. How many of you know many times we shy away from spreading the gospel because we say we don't know the Bible enough. We don't know how to teach someone. Let me tell you, your story is enough to bring someone to Christ. You just have to be obedient in spreading the gospel. And it will multiply greatly in Kabecha. Put in there, Kabecha, GQ, the Krebs. Eh? <laughs> Come on, young people have now redubbed the GQ because they can't pronounce. I, I heard this funny thing. That I must tell you the story. We're sitting on the plane coming back from, from, from Joburg, and the pilot made a horrible mistake, in my, in, in my opinion. He said, guys, enjoy the flight with us today as we go back to Cabrera. I said, which flight are we on, Diesel? Are we on the right flight? We're going back to Cabrera now. <laughs> I said, okay, he has, he's not from Cabrera. He is from Joburg. Okay. So anyway, he spoke so nicely, and he's of, he's, he's of my, my uh, background, so he's Afrikaans, so forgive him. Okay, he couldn't pronounce the name. But anyway, this pilot was probably from Pretoria, a bull supporter after all, you know. For all the bull supporters. Who's bull supporters here? Yeah? <laughs> I'm a lion supporter. That's why I always rag the bull supporters. Don't worry. Okay, at the end of the day, we all love people the same way. But the thing is, at the end of the day, God wants to use you in Kabecha, in Port Elizabeth, if you can't pronounce it. In Kabecha, if you want to say it that way. Amen. If you're in this place, if you're sitting in this place this morning, in the open door, in Westring, in Malabar, wherever you're living, if you're living on the other side, if you're living downtown, if you're living in Summerstrand, you are placed in that place so that people can be multiplied into the kingdom of God. God has placed the church as the light. God has placed the church as, a sol as the salt of the earth, amen? So you and I need to shine our light so that people can come to salvation. Discipleship is so important. How are we going to multiply? There are many ways that we can multiply. How are we going to see this happen? Invite someone to church with you. Simple. Invite them to watch online if they don't want to come to church at first. Tell them about the YouTube channel if you want to do it that way. Tell them about the good news story that happened in your life, your testimony, how God saved you. There are many multiple ways that you can share the good news with people. Tell them what Christ has done for you today, yesterday, last week. There's always a fresh testimony of what God has done in your life. Amen. And so you and I cannot be quiet. We need to share the gospel with people of the goodness of God in our lives, and people will be multiplied. The church will multiply. If you invited one more person, this church will be too small next Sunday. Did you ever think about that? If there was one stranger sitting next to you next Sunday, this church will be too small. The building will be too small. We'll be meeting outside. How's that? But that's powerful because that's what God has called us to do. How many times do we neglect to share the good news with someone around us? How many times do we shrink back because we are so afraid that someone might not like us? Amen? Come on. The world is mad about popularity. People in the church are even trying to be popular, so they preach false gospels. Come on. It's about popularity. If you're in a popularity contest, you're in the wrong kingdom. God has not called us to be popular, but God has called us to reach out to the lost in love, to talk about Christ and what He's done for us, and changed and transformed our lives so that other people's lives may be transformed. Amen. Do you live out the gospel in your neighborhood? Kabecha. 
Karicha, all the gas. Amen. The second thing that will begin to happen is that we need to do is to build the gospel. Then the word gospel comes from the old English meaning good and spell, meaning news, a story in Christianity. The term good news refers to the story of Jesus Christ's birth, death, and resurrection. The word gospel reflects the Greek word for good news or momentous news. The good news is what God has done in Jesus Christ, supremely in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. How many can't wait to tell people about good news? I mean, you got good news. Zeno, you've been promoted recently in workplace. Is that right? Amen. Pardon? New job. There we go. Whole new promotion to your new job. Amen. Well done. But that's good news. Could you wait to tell your family? As soon as you heard about it, you told them, Mama, get the job gekry. Amen. And Mama was dancing. Yay, my son, my boy. Well done. <laughs> Mama posted it on Facebook. Everybody could see. Did you? Is that what happened? Is that about right? Amen. Amen, Vanessa. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I phoned my, my parents, and Liesl phoned her parents when our first child was, when we, we felt pregnant with our first one, you know, that one was still planned. Amen. So at the end of the day, <laughs> when we were still with Rebecca, and, 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 we, and we say, we, we're pregnant. We're pregnant. Yeah, we're pregnant. These days, when it's not I'm pregnant, we're pregnant, husband and wife. Because we're gonna, then the family goes ballistic. It's good news. Wow. We're pregnant. We can have a grandchild. We can have a child and all of these things. But we can't wait to spread this news about this baby that's going to come into the family. And then the second one comes. And then the Lord decides we must have a third one. Amen. Good news still. Because God knows what He's doing. We don't always know what we're doing, but He knows. Amen. Good news. But the thing is, good news has never been meant to keep, to keep with you. Good news is not good news when everyone else doesn't know about it. People spread good news. People want to talk about it. People want to come. When you come to church, guess what? I got that job you guys prayed for You says with your connect group. Guess what, guys? My mother was healed from cancer. I mean, the good news. You can't wait to tell people about the good news. How come the gospel is different? I think we forgot that it's good news. That Jesus died for the whole world and forgave the sins of the world. And that when people repent and turn to Christ, they can too also be saved. Amen. Won't you refresh that in your spirit again this morning that it's good news and it's meant to be spread out to other people. It's meant to give out, meant to tell your neighbors. I mean, if you have good news within you this morning, why aren't you telling your family members? Why aren't you sharing the gospel with them? Why are you not concerned about their salvation? God has called us to spread the good news. And the book of Acts speaks about this again. How it spread, the good news was built. Acts chapter 12, verse 20 to 24. Listen to this. This is quite a hectic story in the Bible. It says, Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace, because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, apparel, sat on his throne, and gave an oration to them. Let's finish there. Verse 22. Next slide. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man, the voice of a God and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him. <laughs> Have you ever heard stories like this in the Bible? The angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. Remember I told you last? Some people believe they're just going to be eaten by the worms, and that's the end of their life. And this is what happened to Herod. But listen to verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. The word of God grew and multiplied. Matthew chapter 4 speaks about the sower, the parable of the sower. Let me tell you something about the sower. The sower did not decide which ground it wants to sow into. Amen. The sower didn't say, I'm only going to go look for good soil to sow my seed into. The word, in other words, the word is the seed. He sowed it on rocky ground. He sowed it amongst the thistles and he sowed it in the good soil. The word of God, God has not called each one of us to decide who will receive the word and who will not receive the word. The word must be sown generously on all ground. What happens after that is up to the person that receives the word. Whether their heart, their heart is not ready to receive it, then it will die. If the worries of life choke it, it will die. If they allow the enemy to come and steal it, it will be stolen on the wayside. 
But if the seed falls on fertile ground, because you don't know who's sitting here this morning, who's listening online, who's your neighbor, if your neighbor's ready in the season, you need to continue to sow the word because some people will get saved. Amen. Don't give up so generously. Don't choose, oh, I think this guy at work doesn't deserve to become a Christian, you know. You know we think like that. We don't talk like that, but we think like that. I don't, I don't actually particularly want that work colleague of mine to come join our church because I don't like them. You know, that neighbor's a real irritation to me. <laughs> you know, that family member, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to share the gospel with them because they'd be nasty to me. Do you see what we do? We don't, show, we don't sow generously so people don't get saved. It's not for you to decide who will get saved. Amen. It's for you to go out and sp spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I found a story in the Bible of a guy called Mephibosheth. How many of you know of a guy called Mephibosheth? My kid says, who? I've never heard of that guy. That's a swear word, Dad. Mephibosheth. Hey, it sounds like a, you're busy swearing someone in a different language. Second Samuel chapter 9. Do yourself a favor. Go and read the story of Mephibosheth. Now, the Mephibosheth, who was Mephibosheth? <laughs> it's a tongue twister. Who was he? Let's listen what happened to him. He was called to the king's table. Amen. After David became king, he made him to sit at his table. But listen what happens to this. This is Saul's grandson. This is Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son. You know what happened when a new king came into power? Just like in nature, when a lion takes over pride, he kills all the other cubs and every other family member that doesn't belong to his seed or his line. He was hiding away from King David because he thought King David was going to kill him. But King David was looking for him so that he can bless him. You see, many of us, listen to this, what happens. I'm going to sum it up for you, 2 Samuel 9. It's a whole chapter there. We are hiding, we are weak, we are lame, we are fearful before the king who comes to us. Many times we think we don't deserve what God wants to give us. But God says, I'm looking for you. I'm looking for your neighbor. I'm looking for that family member. I want to bless them. Why aren't you sharing with them? We are separated from our king. In many ways, when we were in the world, we are separated ourselves from the king because we didn't know him or his love for us. Do you know that God loves you this morning? Unconditionally. If you know the love of God, you'll begin to share the gospel, the good news with other people. Un Amen. The king returns to us more than what we lost when we hid from him. How many of you know that God restores more than what you lost? So many people don't want to come to the king, want to come to Jesus because of what they're going to lose. I'm going to lose friendships. I'm going to lose popularity. I'm going to lose all these things. I'm going to lose, I can't be rich if I'm a Christian. Eh? All these ideas that come through people's minds. Listen to where the story goes. Next slide. We can eat at the king's table. You know what King David did? He invited Mephibosheth to his table to come and sit at his table, to come and eat. Do you know Mephibosheth had a... a, 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 a um, two lame legs or two lame feet. He couldn't walk properly. So they basically had to carry him to the king. He was injured when he was a young boy, when they ran out, when the crusade, when the raids happened and he fell. The servant carried him out and he was injured. Even him sitting at the table, he was ashamed of what was going on with his legs, these feet that don't work. God is not ashamed to call you into his kingdom. God is not ashamed to say, come into my house. No matter what you look like, sound like, feel like, or whatever has happened in your life, God wants to call you to the table this morning to come and sit with him. God will begin to cover. Listen to this last part. No matter who you are, what we have done, the king still loves us unconditionally. You are seated at the king of king's table, and now your weaknesses and your inadequacies are covered. You are set free. And that's what the Lord's doing this morning. He's inviting you to come and sit at his table, to come and sit and dine with him, to come and know his love for you. The kingdom of God is for everybody. Invite them in. And the last, last point is to build the church. How many of you know that God has called us to build the church? We're not going to go through that definition of the church. It's the ecclesia, the called out ones, the ones that want to come together to worship God and serve him and his purposes in this generation. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 9 verse 31 says, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. How many of you know the church is not the building? The church are the people. Every time someone gets saved, the church is multiplied. 
Every time we plant a new church, the church is multiplied. But the church is not the brick and the mortar that you see around you this morning. The church are the people. The church exists online even. The church are the people sitting this morning that's part of the service. All the people that belong to Christ all across the world is the body of Jesus Christ. And that is the true church. Amen. And you might say this morning, but that neighbor of mine never goes to church. That neighbor of yours might be saved and be part of the church. You don't know. Amen. Go and find out. Go and see what God is doing. The Lord is busy multiplying. And I'm going to tell you this morning, there's only one person that can multiply the church. There's only one church person that can build the church. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you that this morning out of Acts chapter 13 verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Who said to them to separate Barnabas and Saul? The Holy Spirit. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit so that we may see the church being built, the gospel being built, and disciples being built in our day and in our age. We're going to multiply the church like never before because the devil is busy multiplying his disciples. We will be busy multiplying disciples of Jesus Christ. 